الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون. For the love of أم البنين صل على محمد وآل محمد. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. In the past few weeks. The Shi'as all over the world commemorated the martyrdom anniversary of the Lady of Light, as Siddiqat Al Kubra, Fatima Al Zahra, alayhi salam, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayh, the mother of the Imams, and the wife of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And today we gather to commemorate the death anniversary of another wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, and that is Umm al-Baneen, Fatima bint Huzam al-Kilabiyah, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, and the brothers of al-Abbas who were killed on the day of Ashura, along with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Now, of course, in her last will, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she asked her husband, Imam Ali alayhi salam, to marry after her. She tells him, in her last words, she tells him, وَتَزَوَّجْ مِنْ بَعْدِي بِبْنَةَ أُخْتِي أَمَامَهِ I want you, O oh Ali, after me to marry my niece, Amama. فَإِنَّهَا تَكُونْ لِوَلَدَيَّ مِثْلِي وَإِنَّ لِلْرِجَالِ لَا بُدَّ لَهُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ She says, O oh Ali, I want you to marry after me my niece Amama because she will be to my children as what I was to my children. She will love, she will show them the love, the mercy, the compassion, that children require in a household. And a man is in need of getting married. A woman is in need of getting married and a man is in need of getting married. فَإِنَّ لِلْرِجَالِ لَا بُدَّ لَهُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ So Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, after the martyrdom of Lady Fatima alayhi salam, he did exactly what Fatima al-Zahra asked him to do. He married Amama, the daughter of Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She was the niece of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And she married Amir al-Mu'mineen 
And she stayed with Amir al-Mu'mineen from the year 11 after Hijrah all the way until the istishhad, the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, until the year 40 after Hijrah. And she had children and she became one of the wives of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, since today we are commemorating the death anniversary of Umm al banin one of the wives of Amir al-Mu'mineen, I decided to give, it, give us a little glimpse on the wives of Imam Ali alayhi salam. We talk a lot about the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We know about the wives of the Prophet. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he also had several wives and he had many children. They say he had between 30 to 35 children between sons and daughters and many of them were killed on the day of Ashura along with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So Amir al Mu'mineen, of course, in total, they count that he had eight wives, all of them throughout his lifetime. Now, of course, a man cannot have more than four wives at once. The only exception was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who had more than four wives when he at one, at one time. However, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, throughout his whole life, he married eight women. One of them, for example, was Fatima Zahra, who passed away. There were others who did not remain very long, and there were others who were with Amir al-Mu'mineen. We will mention them. We'll mention some of them, not all of them. The first was Amama, the daughter of Zainab, and she is the niece of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and the husband of Zainab, the daughter of the Prophet is Abil As. Abil As, he was the husband of Zainab. Of course, Zainab died during the life of the Prophet. She died during the life of Rasulullah. When Rasulullah passed away, he only had one daughter that was living and that was Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and she only lived a few months after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and she also was martyred. She also left this life. So Amir al-Mu'mineen married Amama and according to some narrations, it says that when Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he was struck in the month of Ramadan, when he was struck, he did a will. In his will, he asked Amama to also marry one of the relatives from Bani Hashim because they say he was worried that Muawiyah was going to come or someone from Bani Umayyah was going to come and see a lady who was not married, they're going to come and take her. And at that time, a lady who was not married was vulnerable. Today, when we talk about marriage, some people, they might say, you know, why did the Prophet have more than one wives? Why did Imam Ali have more than one wives? Why did the, why did, you know, the Imams have more than one wives? Because now, Marriage is convenience. A lady could stay not married for a very long time. A man could stay not married for a very long time and nothing happens. But at that time, for the sake of survival, for the sake of the family, marriage was something that was very necessary. And this is why Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, she tells Imam Ali, she tells him, I want you to get married after me. She tells him, she tells him, get married because the kids, they need someone and you also need someone. So Amir al-Mu'mineen married Amama and another wife that Imam Ali alayhi salam married was a lady, a good lady, a very pious lady, a very believing lady by the name of Asma bint Umais. Asma bint Umais, she was from the early Muslims from those who joined the religion of Islam from the early days. And she was the wife of Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali, the wife of Ja'far al-Tayyar. Ja'far, the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he married her and they both migrated together. You know, when we talk about the Hijrah, when we talk about the migration, when people think of the Hijrah of the Muslims, the first Hijrah people think of, the migration is from Mecca to Medina. However, there was a migration before that. Before Islam came to Medina, a group of Muslims along with Ja'far and Asma and several others, 
they migrated to Africa. They mig migrated to Abyssinia. Because if you look at the map, you see Mecca is right by the Red Sea. They got on a boat, they crossed it, they go west, and they reach Ethiopia, current day Ethiopia. And that was the first land that accepted the Muslims. The first continent that accepted the Muslims was the African continent. And, and Najashi over there, he welcomed them and he allowed them to stay. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he saw that the Muslims were persecuted in Mecca. So he sent a group of them to go and settle in Africa, to settle in Ethiopia. Then once he migrated to Medina, he called for them to come back. So Asma bint Umais, she was married to Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And they migrated together. She was from the first Muhajireen, the first who migrated for the sake of religion. And this is a big task. This is something very big for people to migrate, to leave their land, to leave their home, to leave their comfort, to leave everything that they know for the sake of God. This is a hijrah fi sabilillah. And this is what they did. So Asma bint Umais, she was one of those ladies. She was with Ja'far. Then Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he comes back and Ja'far was killed in the battle of Mu'ta. In the battle of Mu'ta in Jordan, current day Jordan, Ja'far al-Tayyar was killed. And this was during the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It was very heartbreaking for Rasulullah to hear of what happened to Ja'far. And Rasulullah was in the masjid and he's telling people, I see, I see them fighting. He's explaining to them what happened and he tells them, Ja'far, his arms were cut off and Ja'far was killed and he began to cry. So after the death of Ja'far, Abu Bakr, he married Asma. Asma was the wife of Ja'far and she gave birth to Abdullah ibn Ja'far who later on becomes the husband of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. So Asma with Ja'far, she has Abdullah. Then she marries Abu Bakr after the death of Ja'far and from Abu Bakr she has Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr who becomes one of the staunchest Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, one of the closest supporters of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Because after the death of Abu Bakr, Asma was married to Amir al-Mu'mineen Imam Ali and Muhammad was young he comes under the care of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he sees Amir al-Mu'mineen. He sees the fatherly figure of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib and he becomes one of the closest Shi'as of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He becomes older, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he sends him to Egypt. He sends him to be the governor of Egypt before sending Malik al-Ashtar and Muawiyah kills him. And they kill him and they stuff his body into the body of a donkey and they burn the donkey. This is the man who is the son of Abu Bakr. They don't say he's the son of Abu Bakr. Aisha, she is Ummul Mu'mineen, she is his sister. You see, everyone talks about Aisha, the wife of the Prophet and the daughter of Abu Bakr, but no one talks about Muhammad. Why? Because he was a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because he was a follower of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's the brother of Aisha, he's the son of Abu Bakr. Muawiyah killed him, but no one no one brings this up. Anyways, Asma was a good lady. When we talk about the days of the death of Fatima al-Zahra, we mention Asma said this and Asma said that because she was in and out of the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And they say that when Fatima al-Zahra in her last days, she was worried. Why? Because at that time when they carry the casket, when someone dies, they carry the casket the figure of the body would show. So Asma tells Fatima to Zahra, tells her, don't worry. When I went to Africa, I saw that they would create a coffin. They would create a coffin. They place the body in where the figure of the body does not show. So she tells Fatima to Zahra, I promise you that we will make you one of those. And she says, that was a moment that I saw Fatima Zahra smile because her body was not going to be revealed even after her death. So this was Asma and Asma had children who were killed in the way of Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
or were killed in the way of of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. One of them was Aun, Aun, the son of Amir al Mu'minin. So Asma had one son from Ja'far, Abdullah ibn Ja'far, who ended up marrying Zainab. She has Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was martyred in, for the sake of Amir al Mu'minin, for the sake of the Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam. And she also had Aun, Aun and Yahya, and they were killed on the day of Ashura along with Imam al Hussein, their brother Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Now, another one from the wives, another from the wives of Amir al Mu'mineen was a lady who was known as Al Hanafiya. And her name is Khawla bin Ja'far. Khawla bin Ja'far al Hanafiya. This is another wife of Amir al Mu'mineen. Her son is Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. When we talk about one of the children of Amir al-Mu'mineen, those who stand out, the prominent sons of Amir al-Mu'mineen, is a man by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya. And he wrote a letter to al-Mukhtar. Muhammad was not killed on the day of Ashura, he stayed in Medina. He wrote a letter to al-Mukhtar, he, he tells Mukhtar, avenge the martyrdom of my brother Imam al Hussein and kill those who stood against Imam al Hussein." So he had, a, he had a significant role after the death of Imam al Hussein. This lady, Khawla bin Ja'far, it's really sad what happened to her. She is from a tribe of Bani Nuwayra, Malik ibn Nuwayra. She is from a tribe that had joined the religion of Islam during the life of Rasulullah The leader of that tribe was a man by the name of Malik ibn Nuwayra. Malik ibn Nuwayra, he comes to the masjid, he sees Rasulullah he tells Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, after you, who is the leader? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells him, you see that man over there pointing to Imam Ali? Tells him he's the leader after me. So Malik ibn Nuwayra, he, he says, this is the leader that Rasulullah told me. And he goes back to his tribe. After the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Malik ibn Nuwayra, he comes back to Medina carrying money with him, carrying zakat with him. Sadaqat and zakat, people have given him. They tell him, go and give this to Rasulullah. So Malik, he comes. Instead of seeing Imam Ali sitting on the member, he sees someone else sitting on the member. So what does he do? He has to do what every person is, who is entrusted with a, with a amana, with a trust to do. They told him, go and give it to the one who is the wasi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He goes and he sees someone else. So now he has to go and give the amanat. He has to go and give the trust back to their people. If they want to give it to Abu Bakr, they could give it to Abu Bakr. But he was told that the leader after Rasulullah was Imam Ali. So he goes back. What did the establishment understand from his movement? They accused him of rejecting Islam and refusing to give zakat. This is why when you read about the life of Abu Bakr, Immediately after the death of the Prophet, they talk about Harub al Ridda, the apostasy wars, where some people turned against Islam. Now, perhaps there was a small group of people that did leave Islam, but many of them did not leave Islam, the Islam of Rasulullah. They left the Islam of what they were seeing in front of their eyes. They did not want to accept Abu Bakr as the leader. So, what did they accuse them? They accused them of being. Kufar, they accused them of going back to apostasy. So Abu Bakr, he sends a man who was very vicious, a man who was known for his viciousness. And that was Khalid ibn al-Walid, the man who in the day of Uhud, he was the one who came and he brought the army of the Kufar to kill the Muslims and kill Hamza. Anyways, Khalid ibn al-Walid, he becomes a Muslim, apparently. And he becomes a man who's carrying a sword and he's going around killing people in the name of the government. Khalid ibn al-Walid, he goes to the tribe of Malik ibn Nuwayra and he sees that they're reciting Adhan, he sees that they're praying. He goes and he kills Malik ibn Nuwayra. And that night, he sexually assaults his wife, the wife of Malik ibn Nuwayra. And then he takes the head of Malik ibn Nuwayra and he places it under a pot. 
You know, a pot requires three rocks. They used, to, they used to put three rocks so that a pot could sit on it. He puts two rocks and he puts the head of Malik ibn Nuhayla. He puts it there. They go back to Medina. The Muslims, there's chaos. Some people say, what did Khalid do? Others say, leave him. Khalid is good. Khalid is bad. One of those who was against Khalid was Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said what he did was wrong. He killed a man and then he slept with his wife that same night. So Abu Bakr, he says, leave him. Khalid is safe Allah. Khalid is the sword of God. Leave him. Anyways, when they brought back, when they brought back people who were prisoners from that tribe, one of the ladies that was brought back as a asira, as a prisoner of war, as a slave, because they considered them to be non-Muslims, they considered them to have left Islam, they bring back these people as slaves, even though they were Muslim. They were Muslim, but they bring them back as slaves. One of them was Khawla bin Ja'far. Khawla bin Ja'far, she's brought back as a asira, as a sabiyya. So the ruling is if someone is not a Muslim, and captured in war, then anyone could come and marry her without a aqid, without mahar, without anything. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he saw Khawla bin Ja'far and he married her. Now, some people they come and they say, how could Imam Ali come and marry this lady? If the act of bringing her was an illegitimate act, how could he come and marry her? Because the whole act of bringing her and considering her a sabiyya was wrong. Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he asks Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. You know Jabir, he met Imam al-Baqir. He met Rasulullah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Hasan, Imam al-Hussein, Imam Zayn al-Abdeen, Imam al-Baqir. Rasulullah tells him, you're going to meet my grandson, Imam al-Baqir. He meets Imam al-Baqir and he tells him, how did your grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib marry Khawla bin Ja'far? Bint al-Hanafiyya. Imam al-Baqir, he tells him, Amir al-Mu'mineen did not marry her immediately. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he took her and he placed her with Asma. She was a prisoner with the Muslims. So he came and he places her with Asma. Then he calls upon her tribe. He calls upon her family to come. Once her family comes, he proposes to marry her from her family and he gives her the mahar. So he does a marriage. And her tribe, they loved Imam Ali because they were the Shia of Imam Ali and they were killed because they were the Shia of Imam Ali. So she married Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. This was one of the wives of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Another wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen whom we are gathered here to remember and commemorate was Umm al-Baneen, Fatima bint Huzam al-Kilabiyah. This lady, Perhaps out of the wives of Amir al-Mu'mineen, other than Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she stands out. And she is remembered. Every year she is remembered. Every Muharram she is remembered. The Shias all over the world, they do a nidr. They do a vow in the name of Umm al-Baneen. Recite a Fatiha for the soul of Umm al-Baneen and you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your du'as for the sake of Umm al-Baneen. For the sake of Umm al -Baneen. do tawassul in Umm al -Baneen. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he asks his brother Aqil, his older brother Aqil. Aqil was known to know the tribes and the lineages and the traits of the Arabs. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he tells Aqil, he tells him, Ya Aqil, ukhtub liya mra'atan waladatha al-fuhul min al-Arab. He tells him, Oh Aqil, I want you to find me a lady who was born from a brave family, who was born from bravery. Aqil tells him, Ya Ali, why are you looking for a lady who is, who is known for bravery? Usually when someone is looking for a wife, that's not the first thing that comes into their mind. They think of looks, they think of faith, they think of all these other things. Who thinks of bravery? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he tells him, لِأُرْزَقْ مِنْهَا وِلْدًا أو وَلَدًا لِيَوْمِ الْحُسَيْنِ لِيَوْمِ الشِدَّةِ He says, so I have from her children that will be at the aid of my son Hussein on the day of Ashura. 
What does this teach us? This teaches us that when you're getting married, you have to look at the qualities because these qualities, they're passed on. If someone is stingy, that's going to be passed on. If someone is brave, that's a quality that is passed on. Just as you have inherited genetic traits, you have qualities, you have lifestyles. These are also passed on. Passed on either through nurture and nature, they're passed on. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, he tells his brother, find me a lady who's known, who comes from a brave family. So Aqil, he tells him, I found you a lady, she has all of the good qualities. A lady by the name of Fatima bint Huzam, her father is Huzam, al Kilabiyah from the tribe of Kilab. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, he sees her and he is stunned by her beauty. He sees she's very beautiful. She has all of the good qualities. He asks her, he tells her, it's your wedding night. You're getting married. What is it that you expect of me? What is it that I could give you? If there's anything I could give you, what is it? She tells him, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, I want you to not call me by my name anymore. He tells her, why? Your name is beautiful. She tells him, my name is Fatima. And when you call me by my name, this might break the heart of Hassan and Hussein and Zainab and Umm Kulthum because they have lost their mother Fatima. And I want them to know that I'm a servant of Fatima, that I'm the servant of the children of Fatima. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he called her Umm al the mother of the sons. And she did become Umm al -Baneen. She gave four sons to Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Al-Abbas, Ja'far, Abdullah, and Uthman. And Imam Ali, he named one of his sons Uthman. They asked him why. He said, I name him Uthman after one of the Sahaba of Rasulullah, Uthman ibn Mad'oon, one of the good men, one of the close companions of Rasulullah, Uthman ibn Mad'oon. He said, I name my son, after Uthman ibn Mad'oon. Now, why do people get married? What is the purpose of marriage? Imam Ali, we're talking about the marriages of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Today, there's a growing number of people that say, I don't want to get married anymore. Or there's a growing number of people that choose to live a life of not getting married, a spinster or a anus someone who's refusing to get married, or someone who cannot get married. What's the purpose of marriage? Today, some people, they come and they say, marriage is a burden. Marriage is a headache. I have to worry about myself, and then I have to come and worry about someone else. And this is why in many societies, and in this society, there are many that are choosing to delay marriage, and there, there are many that are choosing to live a lifestyle of not getting married. Right now in China, there are over 30 million unmarried men. Over 30 million unmarried men. That's more than a population of some countries. People that are not getting married. Either because society has made it so difficult or because they keep making up excuses. I, can't, I haven't found the right person. Some people, they keep getting older and older and older and they keep saying, I haven't found the right person. As if you are the right person. You're not 100% either. Everyone, everyone has some issues. We, this, the whole purpose of marriage is to complete one another. To finish one another. To complete one another. Maybe I don't have a quality that my partner could finish that in me. Could complete that in me. So some people are choosing not to get married. And Islam is against this ideology. Islam is against this mentality. Now, yes, someone might say this is a personal decision. It is a personal decision. It's not haram to not get married, but it goes against the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And it can become haram. The rulings in Islam, they, they're subject to change. Something might be halal right now, tomorrow it might be haram. For example, in the month of Ramadan, I can't eat during the day, but on any other day I could eat. Rulings change. Something could be mustahab right now. It could become wajib tomorrow. What is it? 
This is what the, the example that people give regarding marriage. Marriage in itself is mustahab. as zawaju sunnati. Rasulullah says marriage is from my sunnah. Marriage is from my tradition. However, if someone does not get married and they end up falling in haram because they're not married, Scholars say marriage becomes wajib upon this person. Marriage becomes obligatory because you're protecting yourself from, from harm. You're protecting yourself from falling in haram. That's like someone saying, I don't want to take medicine, for example. Medicine is not wajib to take. But if your life depends on it, if you're going to die without taking medicine, it becomes wajib to take that medicine. Rulings change. Same with marriage. The original ruling of marriage is that it's mustahab. As zawaju sunnati, faman ragiba an sunnati, fanaisa minni. Rasulullah says, whoever rejects my sunnah is not a part of me. In fact, marriage is regarded as one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the miracles of God. You want to find God? Find God through how He created two genders, two sexes, and they're able to complete one another. They're able to finish one another, they're able to reproduce with one another. This is a sign of Allah, this is a mu'jaza, a miracle. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ From amongst the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا One of the signs of God is that He created you in pairs. From yourselves, from amongst yourselves, He created you in pairs. Why? لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you may find sukoon, tranquility with one another, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he places between yourselves mawadda love and rahma mercy. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ These are signs for those people who ponder, for those people who think. When you look at the signs of Allah, you have to do tafakkur, you have to think. One of the signs of Allah is how Allah created people and how Allah created the two genders. How people can get married. Now yes, today they'll come and they'll tell you there's 26, 27 genders. All, they make up things here and there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the male and the female. This is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it's a duty upon individuals to help those who cannot get married. That's also an obligation. Allah says, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَا مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ And يَكُونُوا فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِهُمَ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ You're not only required to get yourself married, you're required to help others get married. I've seen some organizations, there are some institutions that help sponsor those who are getting married, that help give, you know, incentives to help those get married. Because one of the first excuses people have with regards to not getting married is what? I can't afford it, I don't have money. We need to have institutions. We need to have programs. We need to have systems that help people get to know one another, find the right person, and help them get married. If they're lacking some money, if they need help finding a house, if they need help finding a job, if they need support, these institutions need to support them. This is one of the purposes of Islam. Islam is a social institution, not just a spiritual institution. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he saw a man committing a haram act, the act of finding self-pleasure. He, he, they, they brought him to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he struck him on his hand. And then he tells him, why are you not married? He says, I cannot afford getting married. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he goes to the Bayt al-Mal, the Muslim treasury, he gives him money and he tells him, go and get married. Now you don't have an excuse to not get married. This is the system. This Islam is supposed to bring solutions to problems. If we're not bringing solutions, then yes, we're going to find problems. This is, the, this is why it, it's important for religious institutions, it's important for the community to work together to establish these programs and institutions that help bring solutions to these problems. Marriage, according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says marriage, the person who is married, their salah and their ibadah is worth 70 times that of a person who is not married. Now why is there such an insistence? Someone could come and say, you know, my spirituality, my prayer is between me and God. What does it have to do if I'm married or not married? 
The answer, my dear brothers and sisters, is that marriage gives you a form of immunity. It gives you a form of protection. It gives you a form of strength. Because we have needs. No one could come and say, I don't have needs. I live a life without needs. Every single person, no matter how strong, no matter how mu'min, no matter how much of a believer you are, you have needs. We all have needs. Can someone ignore their needs? You can't ignore your needs. Now, yes, some societies, some cultures look at some of the needs as a taboo topic. Don't talk about this. Islam says, no, we have to address every single need that people have. Because God created you with that need. Can you come and find someone who's hungry and you tell this person, don't say I'm hungry. Don't say I'm hungry. Don't talk about food. No, because everyone has that need. And we have all sorts of needs. And Islam gives us a solution. Societies and cultures, they come and they establish barriers. They make it difficult to get married. They create roadblocks. They make it more expensive. They make it more difficult to fulfill those needs in the halal way. Then people, they resort to finding the need in the haram way. And that's where problems emerge. One of the needs that we have as humans is that we are social beings. We are created to socialize. We are not created to live alone. This is why in prisons, in the jail, if they want to punish someone, what do they do to them? They place them in solitary confinement. They place them all alone. That's the worst type of adab. That's the worst type of punishment. Someone might say, you know, come and beat me up, hit me and don't put me alone. I want to see people. Even if you're in the best house, you're in the best city, you have everything. If you're alone, you're going to be suffering. There's a statement in Arabic, Al-Jannah bila nas, matindas. Meaning that if you put someone in heaven, you put someone in the best place, but the, there's no people there, no one wants to be there. You don't want to be there. Now, someone comes and they try to please themselves. They try to make it up. I'm going to go buy the nicest car. I'm going to go buy clothes. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to... If you're living alone, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be suffering. We are created as social beings and Islam encourages us to socialize. This is why you could pray alone, but if you pray together, the thawab is multiplied. You could eat alone, but if you eat with other people, you get thawab. It's makruh to eat alone. Sleeping alone in a house is makruh. Being alone, traveling alone is makruh. You have to always be together with people because it's a form of protection. It's also a form of social protection. You, you have someone who is with you. Today you find people, they're sitting alone. And now we're living in a time where technology and the internet, it encourages people to be more alone. Right now you all heard about this metaverse, metaverse that Facebook is making. You could have a house, you could have a town, you could live next to, for example, Snoop Dogg or live next to whoever you want. You buy a house, expensive. People pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to be a neighbor of, for example, the celebrity. You're a neighbor in a fake virtual world. You're paying money to be the neighbor of this person. And you see this person is sitting miserably at home, but he goes, he says, I'm the neighbor of, for example, this person and that person. This is what society is creating, making people live alone. They're sitting alone on their phone and they think they're socializing, but there's no one, they're alone. No, you're supposed to socialize. You're supposed to talk to people. You're supposed to engage with people. You're supposed to go out and marriage is one of the means of fulfilling that social need that everyone has. You have a social need, find yourself a partner that becomes your friend, that becomes your companion, Someone who you could confide in. Someone who you could talk to. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, when I used to go to Fatima, كانت تنكشف عني الهموم والأحزان. He says, I used to go, look at the face of Fatima. As soon as I look at the face of Fatima, I would forget all of my problems. Today, some husbands and wives, they don't have problems. As soon as they see each other, they're reminded of their problems. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, I used to go to Fatima and she would make me forget all of my problems. So of course, yes, you're supposed to get married and marriage fulfills that purpose. But you have to know who you're marrying from day one. 
Sometimes some people, and early on in their life, you ask them, who do you want to marry? He says, I want to marry the most beautiful girl. I want to marry this person who has this job. I want to marry this one who makes this much money. And then five years later, 10 years later, they realize that this was not the right person for me. I'm living a miserable life. Why? Because their priorities were off from day one. From day one, they were focusing on the looks. They were focusing on the money. They were focusing on which family this person came from, what kind of a car this person has. Then they ended up marrying the wrong person, someone who they can't spend five minutes with one another. This is why it's important for those who are not married to see the akhlaq, the personality of the person that you're going to marry. The personality is more important than the money that this person has. The personality is more important than the looks that this person has. The looks, they change over time. Of course, we're not telling you to find someone who you can't look at, but looks change over time. But the akhlaq, a good heart, a beautiful heart stays forever. And this is why Amir al-Mu'mineen, he tells, Aqeel, find me someone waladatha al-fuhula min al-Arab. Someone who has this quality of bravery. Someone who stands for her faith. No matter what, she'll defend her faith. And this is what she did. She, read, she gave him children who stood on the most difficult day. They stood for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Another need that people have when it comes to marriage is the physical need, the sexual need. Now today some people they come and they say, don't talk about that, this is taboo. But no, this is a need that Allah gave everyone. Men and women have that need. We should not ignore a need that God gave us. Yes, Islam says it needs to be channeled in the right way. It needs to be directed in the right way. It's like someone who's hungry, they need to eat. They come and you tell them, be careful what you eat. Don't eat the filthy food, don't eat the poison, eat the clean food. This is what the whole purpose of marriage. Marriage, it comes and it sets guidelines. Find yourself someone good. Relieve yourself. Satisfy your desires in the halal. Because if it's satisfied in the haram, all of society collapses. All of society falls apart. So today some people, they come and they say, oh yeah, what's wrong with, why is Islam against dating? I want to have a relationship outside of marriage. Why do I have to do the katb al-tab? Why do I have to do the, the nikah? I want to have a relationship outside of marriage. When Allah says you need to have a marriage, this is for your own good. Why? Because when you get married, when you do the katb al-tab, you're entering into a contract. You're signing a contract with this person. When you sign a contract, you acknowledge that you have responsibilities and you have duties and they have responsibilities and duties. When people are dating outside of marriage, do they acknowledge these responsibilities? Do they acknowledge these duties? No. They go, they sleep with one another, there's a kid, and then they come and they throw it at the girl. Or they come and they throw it at society and that's it. Or today they come and they say, yeah, let them just go have abortion. Millions of, millions, let them be, let them abort every year. Make it that easy. Instead of dealing with the problem from, from the beginning, they come and they say, yeah, the easiest solution is just to have abortion, which is haram. It's a life, it's a soul. So, Islam says channel that desire and channel it through getting married. Marriage is the best way to channel that desire. And third, my dear brothers and sisters, marriage is a means to build a family. Every single one of us has the desire to have a family, to grow a family. You want to see your offspring, you want to see your children, you want to see your traits, whether they are the physical genetic traits or they are the qualities, the principles that you stand for, you want to see that passed on to future generations. For example, you're a believer in something, you want that faith, you want that principle to be passed on to your children. You want that to be passed on, you like that quality, you want that to be passed on. Of course, the only way to do so is through marriage. Marriage is the means of reproduction. There's no other way. Today, family, society tries to distort the image of the family. They come and they say a man and a man could get married, they could be a family, a woman and a woman, they could be a family. But the only biological way of creating a family is through a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. That's the only biological way to have a family and to reproduce. And that is the way that God has provided for us. 
So here, everyone wants to have that desire to reproduce, to have, to see your offspring before you leave this life. You want to see your offspring. This is why we see the prophets in the Quran, they all do dua. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا Ibrahim, he does a dua for the riya. Zakaria, he does a dua for the riya, for her progeny. This is one of the needs that people have. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, he also had that need. Amir al-Mu'mineen didn't just want to have children for the heck of it. Amir al-Mu'mineen wanted to have children who will pass on his ideology. Amir al-Mu'mineen wanted to have sons and daughters who will stand in the most difficult time defending the religion of Islam. This is what he wanted to have. And this is why the sons of Ali were killed on the day of Ashura. The daughters of Ali were taken as prisoners on the day of Ashura. And the only crime was that they are the sons and daughters of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, on the day of Ashura, when they were killing Imam al Hussein, they tell him, We kill you because of your father. And you know Fatima al Zahra why she was attacked? Because she was the wife of Ali, because she defended Ali. It all goes back to Amir al Mu'mineen. Today, Shias all over the world are persecuted. Why? Because they are the Shias of Ali. That's why. It all goes back to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he tells Aqil, he tells him, find me, find me a lady that can give me children that will support my son on the day of Ashura. And Aqil, he found Umm al-Baneen. And Umm al-Baneen, she wasn't just a normal mother. There are mothers, there are mothers that are careless and there are mothers that nourish their children that don't only make their children become healthy physically, they make their children become healthy spiritually. This was Umm al-Baneen. Umm al-Baneen, she disciplined and nourished the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Rasulullah and the family of the Prophet and her children. She taught them from day one, you have to give up for Ali ibn Abi Talib and his children. You have to sacrifice for the Ahlul Bayt. And this is why it's very important at a young age to teach the love of the Ahlul Bayt in your children. One of our maraja, one of our scholars, I heard him say, he says, mothers, a mother, when she wants to put her children to sleep, she sings lullabies and she tells them stories here and there. He says, my mother, our mother would put us to sleep by telling us the tragedy of Abba Abdullah. We, we grew up learning about the story of the Ahlul Bayt That becomes engraved in a person. This is why when you want to tell your children stories of heroes and stories of superheroes, instead of telling them about Superman, who recently they came and they said Superman is gay. Instead of telling them about Superman and Spider-Man and Batman, tell them about Al-Abbas, tell them about Imam al Hussein, tell them about these individuals. Umm al -Baneen, she raised her children to love the Ahlul Bayt. She raised her children to sacrifice for the sake of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. And she gave four sons to Amir al mumineen Al-Abbas was the oldest. Al-Abbas was the first of her sons. The day Al-Abbas was born, Al-Abbas was very beautiful. You know, his title is Qamar Bani Hashim, the moon of Bani Hashim. He was so beautiful, they called him the moon of Bani Hashim. The day he was born, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he goes and he looks at him and he looks at his hands. He moves his hands and he begins to cry. So Umm al banin she tells him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, why are you crying? Is there something wrong with my son? Is there a problem with my newborn son? Imam Ali, he tells her, no, oh, Umm al -Bani, there's nothing wrong with your son. But I remembered how these hands are going to be cut off in the battle defending his brother Abba Abdullah, while he's bringing water for the family of Abba Abdullah and defending Imam al Hussein, his hands will be cut off. Umm al smiled. She said, for the sake of Hussein, 
his hands are going to be cut off for the sake of Hussein. He tells her, yes. She says, may my sons and my life be sacrificed for Hussein and the children of Fatima. This was Umm al-Baneen alayhi salam on the day of Ashura al-Abbas. He sends his brothers, Abdullah, Ja'far, and Uthman. And he himself, he goes and they're all killed in the battle. Then the family of Imam al Hussein, they're being brought back to Medina, this time without Aba Abdullah, without Al Abbas, without the brothers of Abbas. Imam Zain al Abidin, he finds a poet by the name of Bishr ibn Hadlam. He tells him, oh Bishr, your father was a poet. Are you a poet as well? He tells him, yes, I recite poetry. He tells him, ya Bishr, go enter Medina and break the news. Tell people what has happened to my father, Aba Abdullah. So Bishr ibn Hadlam, he rides his horse. He enters ahead of the family. He begins to call out, Ya Ahla Yathribala Muqa'ama Lakum Biha. O oh, people of Yathrib, O oh, people of Medina, Medina is not a city to live in anymore. They tell him, Man Khabar, what has happened? Why are you saying Medina is not a city to live in anymore? He tells them, Al Khabar and Qabr Rasulullah. I will break the news next to the grave of Rasulullah. They all gather in Masjid al Nabi. They gather there. Then he tells them, Ya Ahla Yathribala Muqam Alakum Biha. قُتِلَ الْحُسَيْنِ فَأَدْمُعِي مِدْرَارُهُ الْجِسْمُ مِنْهُ بِكَرْبَلَا مُضَرَّجٌ وَالْرَأْسُ مِنْهُ عَلَى الْقَنَاةِ يُدَارُ Medina is not a city to live in anymore because of Abdullah. The one who was born in the city, the one who was raised in the city was killed. His head was raised on a spear and his body was left in the land of Karbala. He said, a lady comes to me. She's carrying a child on her shoulder. She comes to me. She tells me, Ya na'i, akhbirni an waladi al Hussein. Oh man who's breaking the news, who's telling us this news. Tell me what happened to my son Hussein. He says, who, I asked who, this, who is this lady? They tell him, this is Umm al Banin, the mother of Abbas and the brothers of Abbas. So he says, I began to tell her, Ya Umm al Banin, my condolences to you for the loss of your son Uthman. My condolences to you for the loss of your son Ja'far. My condolences to you for the loss of your son Abdullah. She tells him, you have broken my heart. Tell me about my son Hussein. He tells her, Ya Umm al Banin, my condolences to you for the loss of your son Abbas. His arms were cut off in the battlefield. He, he, he says, the baby, the child that was on her shoulder fell to the ground. She began to cry. She said, tell me about my son Hussein. I don't care about anyone else. Tell me about Hussein. He tells her, Ya Umm al-Baneen, Azzam Allah lak al-ajr bi Aba Abdullah al-Hussein. Oh, Umm al-Baneen, yes, Aba Abdullah was killed as well. She began to cry. She goes to the home of Zayn. Uh, Zainab enters into the home of Amir al -Mu'min, Imam al Hussein, and she says, Don't allow anyone to enter on us. Umm al Banin, she goes, she knocks on the door. They tell her, Who are you? She says, I am also grieving. Allow me to enter. Zainab goes to the door. She sees, This is Umm al Banin. As soon as she sees Umm al Banin, she calls out, Wa akha, wa abbasa. My brother Abbas, Umm al -Banin, you reminded me of my brother Abbas. And Umm al -Banin, she calls out, Wa walada wa Husayna. Oh my son Hussein, how can we live without you? Sahat sahat ya fagd al Wallah shmuh shayadur al-ahbab. 
الباب هناك وسمع الصرخة على الباب أنا مع عباس جيت لا تفترين بجد زينب ونادت لقنها بالله ويا يقوم ساعدنها هاي ام البنين الراح منها صناديد اربعه وبالحرب نفلين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير for the love of أم البنين by the sake of أم البنين ask Allah for your hajat ask Allah to grant you your wishes for the sake of this honorable lady, for anyone who's sick, for the hastening of the reappearance of the Imam of our time, to grant us the ziyarah and the shafa'ah of the Ahl al-Bayt of Umm al -Baneen. And we also ask Allah to help all of those who are sick recover, specifically the shifa al-Maridah, Najah bin Zayna. Let us recite this verse five times, Amman Yujib, for her and for anyone who is sick, anyone who has asked for dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muntar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-suh. Amman yujibu al-muntar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-suh. Amman yujibu al-muntar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-suh. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب الفاتح مع الصلوات